so um, like you were saying, so we've won, we've won a set. Um, so I'm wondering if um, the way that we ch are treating patients might have changed um, since we first started. Um, yes. So I guess sort of, the, yeah, so if you could touch on, um, I don't know um, how much information is available to y'all, um, but if you could touch on sort of the, the de I guess the ways the treatments might have changed as we've learned more. Yes, I, I think uh, one of the places that we learned the most about uh, how to treat the uh, COVID-19 patients was in New York City, where there was such a, a big surge of cases and high intensity of patients coming in and filling up all the hospitals. And the doctors, they didn't know how to treat the, these patients. They tried everything they could. They tried what they thought they knew from other types of viral infections or, or lung infections. Um, and for example, they thought, well, well, we'll put people on ventilators. But as, as time went on, they found that ventilators were uh, hurt, hurt a lot of people and harmed people for many different reasons. One is you had to sedate them for long periods of time so that they can uh, accept, accept having a tube down their, down their throat or in, into their lungs and uh, not thrash around with that. And so you had to sedate them. And then they, um, they found that the way that they were forcing air into the lungs was not necessary. Uh, they, they realized they could maybe have the patient not go on a ventilator, but then get good, some good oxygen delivered through prong, simple prongs in the nose, of, as you've seen. And so they're switching a lot of patients now to be treated with ventilator, without ventilators, no ventilators, but with oxygen and positioning the patient to lie in their stomach, which gets more oxygen into their lungs. And we're also realizing that in some cases, the, the patient has a fluid buildup in their lungs at the bottom of their lungs, and that causes gas uh, symptoms that feel like it's gastrointestinal, but it's really irritation at the bottom of the lungs that's irritating the diaphragm. So patients come in and they, they have abdominal pain, and it's, but it's really going on in the bottom of their lungs. It's a pneumonia fluid building up there by the, by the virus. And so they're realizing that and they know how to, what to do about that. And then a third thing is opportunistic of infections of bacteria that come in and like to live in that fluid that builds up in the lung from the coronavirus. And doctors can now uh, immediately recognize that and give the patient some antibiotics that help uh, clear up those bacteria. And lastly, they, they see that the um, virus, when it uh, infects the lungs, doesn't cause the lungs to be all stiff like they, they expected it. They expected that the virus would make the, the walls of the lining of the air sacs of the lung really thick and hard to expand, they needed to put all this air in. They don't think that that's as important. The lungs are much more flexible than they thought. It just, they build up with fluid. And so they've learned all this and they have much better ways of treating the patients. So even when somebody comes into the hospital with severe disease and has some underlying conditions, uh, we can treat them much, much better with a much higher uh, success rate. Um, so I would, uh, you know, so as scientists, as, as, as physicians, we're very optimistic that not only, you know, is it gonna go through the population, maybe perhaps um, be milder as time goes on, but the young people who are healthy are gonna not suffer as much as the people with, with pre-existing conditions. And even so, those with pre-existing conditions, we have a lot of new, new tools to, to treat them. We're much better than we were in the beginning of the, of the uh, pandemic. So optimism and hope is what we, you know, we want to. To that end, as, as Lance alluded to initially with, uh, with regard to our antibody work, one of the new treatment modalities, you know, so Lance described this, uh, now we're not playing from behind. We're learning about our opponent and we understand the opponent's tendencies and we can develop just, you know, great clinical practice uh, from these clinicians when they see a patient coming in without any new therapies, just being able to you know, treat infections and, you know, have patients lay a different way and give them oxygen differently. That's making a massively huge difference in overall uh, mortality. 
uh, which of course is the end game, you know, is at the end of the day is not necessarily to, uh, are we going to be able to prevent everyone from actually getting it? We have social distancing and mask wearing and hygiene and things like this that we're doing to keep the, you know, to keep the curve flat. But if uh, eventually, if we don't get a vaccine, everyone's going to get infected, you know, over time. It's, it's just the natural course of evolution, whether or not it occurs in a week or 10 years, the virus will just keep going, right? And so that's scary on one hand, but also we're just, we're learning so much clinically that the point is, is to reduce mortality, to reduce the death rate. Uh, and that's happening. Some of it's the, from the, just the clinical medicine part. The other one is just new therapies. We have, uh, you know, new FDA approved therapies like remdesivir, um, which has shown, you know, true clinical success in reducing the overall hospitalization time, which is significant because that reduces mortality. But we also have uh, the therapeutic plasma, as we talked about. Those antibodies that we're measuring, these are actually drugs, if you think about them. The patients that recover and convalesce, you know, their body's immune system has produced these antibodies that's important for that individual to basically combat any future infection and may, may confer at least uh, short-term immunity. But also those antibodies, are, those are specific proteins that are actually a therapy that can be given to a recipient that's sick. And we're finding now and there's going to be some nice publications about this, that, that actually the convalescent plasma is a very effective therapy, especially when given to patients early on in their process. And, um, and so, you know, you think about the drumbeat of different types of therapies that are coming out, and there'll be more. We don't know how effective they'll be. We'll have to see. But there's more and more therapies that are being explored, uh, and, and some actually from the cancer field, therapies that were developed for cancer research to, 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 to modulate the immune system of cancer patients, some of those therapies actually are being explored for COVID uh, because, you know, again, much of the reason why COVID kills patients is the body's own reaction to the virus. It's like the body's killing itself uh, in response to just trying to combat the virus. It's not doing it on purpose, obviously. It's trying everything it can evolutionarily to kill the virus. And in doing so, it starts to get organ damage and you start to get what's called a cytokine storm and you can get this process. Some of these other drugs developed for cancer indications or uh, other inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, we're able to take those pre-existing drugs and try them. What's great about that is some of these drugs have already gone through FDA approval for say that cancer indication or that arthritis indication. And we know about you know, their safety a little bit more than just experimental drugs. They've gone through a review. And now you know, we know about them and so we can take them and apply them to a new population of patients and see uh, if they work because they may have some biological rationale. You know, they're hitting specific pathways that we know the the virus may use. So uh, even without a vaccine, uh, you know, I think that there's, as Lance said, a lot of uh, hope for being able to, you know, for reduced uh, mortality. For those of you out there who don't know, Chip's daughter actually plays um, club volleyball and high school volleyball. So I appreciate the analogies there. And I think our audience can, you know, really relate, um, gives them a way to kind of picture it. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> appreciate that. Sure. Go ahead, Anna, with your next question. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I just want to say that this is like very, very helpful for me personally. I know I have trouble sort of sifting through just the absolute just amounts of information that are out there and just trying to figure out like what is factual and what is just like my Facebook feed conjecture. <laughs> um, so you had mentioned um, a vaccine, and I know that's sort of a hot topic right now. Um, so I wonder if you have any insight into um, the progress that's been made into a vaccine. Um, I know putting a, a timeline on that sort of thing is difficult, but um, your best guess, I guess. <laughs> I, I can, I'll speak first, but, but Chip with his uh, FDA background may have 
even better insights than me. But I, I, would, I would say that uh, if we compare it to other vaccines um, that have been developed, let's say for SARS um, or, or for swine flu, the timetable for this is much faster than those other vaccines. But we still have to be just as careful and maybe even more careful because we don't want to cause any harm or any unusual immune effects. Maybe so sometimes these these vaccines, if they're used before they're ready or haven't been tested properly, they cause a, a you know a backlash of the immune system that hurts the patient, and they have autoimmune diseases. Uh, that, that's where your own antibodies are attacking your own tissues and causing problems like joint pain and and other serious effects. So we, if we rush too fast and we don't do a careful um, analysis of potential side effects, then, then if we roll, roll the vaccine out uh, quickly and it starts having a lot of side effects, then nobody's gonna wanna take it. And that will hurt the whole cause of trying to you know, use a vaccine to, to stop this virus. On the other hand, we don't wanna delay any extra time because we need to get this out to, to help everyone. And so it's that balance between having to be very safe, but also moving as fast as possible. And I think we all have been really impressed with all the companies and the different countries and, and the, the NIH and the private sector um, and famous universities all over the world are working on their versions of the vaccines. And all of the preliminary data to date on everybody's progress is hopeful, very hopeful. Um, we don't see in principle any reason why a vaccine wouldn't work, uh, why it would be, you know, not cause uh, immunity. And, but I think the, still we're, we're, the uncertainty is when a safe vaccine is going to be ready might be a year or so. And secondly, are we going to need more than one type of vaccine because there's different strains of the virus around the world? Um, so those are the unanswered questions, but I would say from seeing vaccines, you know, over the years develop on, for other diseases that it, this is moving much, much faster with all the modern scientific advances we have than, than other vaccines in the past. Uh, I've heard, you know, there's a lot of, um, as you said, misinformation or uh, lack of information uh, out there about uh, vaccine efficacy in general and even safety of vaccines. Um, you have uh, folks that are concerned about vaccination, uh, you know, entirely. Um, uh, as well, in the background, we have to address that and understand that. And uh, you know, we can't just poo-poo that and say, you know, these people are idiots because that's not true. You know, they have underpinning reasons why they feel the way they do. Um, so we don't also want to have you know people who, even if a safe vaccine was developed, not trust it because it was rushed too fast. I've heard about, you know, a lot of people say, oh, they're rushing this vaccine and, you know, how can it happen so quickly? And doesn't this mean it would be unsafe? That's a legitimate concern because, you know, to the lay person, you know, all of a sudden, you know, months, it's supposed to take years and suddenly it's months, you know, you could question it. Um, uh, I would say to that, that, you know, that, that it's a legitimate concern, but I think what you're, everyone's discounting because when you're not in the field, uh, you know, you're not in the court, um, you don't really understand the veracity by which the scientific community has pulled together on this. You know, molecular medicine, you know, the tools that we have now, uh, we didn't even have five years ago. You know, there's never been in some ways a test case where this uh, scientific kind of molecular ecosystem has all rallied around a general problem. I mean, HIV was 20 years ago, even more. Uh, and, you know, so when we're faced with this uh, true pandemic that's, aff that's affecting all humanity, um, every country's scientific kind of, you know, ecosystem is rallying around. So the aggregate of all that knowledge and even the technology uh, is really, can truly speed up progress, okay? So just the, the sequencing of the coronavirus genome and the sharing of that information occurred like in days. 
Five years ago, that could have taken months. Uh, but the speed at which data can be shared and which the technology can be elucidating mechanisms. We, we know about the molecules that the virus uses to, uh, to get into the cells. That would have taken years a decade ago. We did that in weeks um, now. We can do large what are called genome-wide association studies or called GWAS, where we're already, we just learned that probably having the O blood type uh, gives you about a 30% uh, decrease in infectivity. But there's something, and because we know that the, the virus has a hematologic or blood component where you get these little micro clots. <clears throat> it's very unique. Why? We don't know. We're learning. Uh, but even there's something about the blood uh, system that this virus is using. <clears throat> and so we're, the, the point of this, why I'm saying this is that it may seem scary to contemplate uh, getting in a vaccine. Even Dr. Fauci has said it's not out of the realm of possibility at the end of this year to have a, you know, a vaccine that we can give you know, 100, 200 million doses uh, to maybe the highest, uh, you know, more, you know, to el the elderly or to people with underpinning health conditions to get them a vaccine first. Um, people are like, that's crazy. It's not entirely crazy because of the massive amount of science going on behind the scenes that truly can accelerate. In fact, there's an article in the paper this morning in the Post that's actually quite provocative that says that the quarantining itself, which has become fairly effective at reducing the numbers, might be the number one enemy against vaccine development because the incidence of the disease is now so low that there's not enough people to test the vaccine in. You know, when you, when you have a vaccine that's developed, they have to give it to, in phase three, they have to give it to a large percent of the population. And they have to basically say, you know, go out and live your life. And you, you basically statistically have, like, I'm going to give it to 30,000 people, say. I know that, you know, the infectivity rate is 1%. So, you know, I would expect 300 people to get the to get it, and what you're hoping to see is that when you give the vaccine that that 300 is like zero, right? But if it's not 1%, if it's 0.1%, then you don't actually have enough people to get infected to actually know whether that vaccine is working. So it's very bizarre and paradoxical that, you know, we, we've initiated such a, you know, in some ways justified fear of getting infected that it actually is very difficult to test a vaccine. They may have to test the vaccine in you know, areas where the, the pandemic is kind of exploding. And we may not be able to test it in the, in the Europe or the U.S. because we everything's so low. People don't realize the infectivity rate is actually extremely low, uh, all things considered. So um, they, they may have to consider other types of, uh, of uh, vaccination type studies. One are called challenge studies, uh, which we've done before with malaria and other uh, diseases where you know, the infectivity rate is low. Uh, with things like malaria, we have effective therapies that we can give the people that are infected. And what you do in these challenge studies is you basically give it to people and purposely infect them, uh, in this instance, with live coronavirus. And that way you know you have 100% infectivity rate. And so you have to balance the ethics of that. You know, how do you ethically consent a patient to say, you know, so, uh, but there's predicates for that. Uh, that can be done. So the point is, is that, um, that while we may actually have a scientific uh, advances, there's other aspects of this could, that could decrease or increase our ability to, from a timeline standpoint, to deliver a safe and effective vaccine. It's a complicated ecosystem. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching that video. If you liked it, give it a like down below and subscribe if you're not already. See y'all next time.